This is a 1991 Oldsmobile Bravada, and it was the luxury SUV before the luxury SUV. This thing predates the BMW X5 by a decade. It came out years before the Cadillac Escalade, the Lincoln Navigator, the Lexus RX, the Mercedes M-Class. It's also hilariously quirky and ridiculous by modern standards. So today I'm going to review the Oldsmobile Bravada, one of the original luxury SUVs, and I'll show you all of its quirks and features. Before I get started, big news, this Oldsmobile Bravada is currently for sale and it's being auctioned live on cars and bids with no reserve. This OG Bravada is in tremendous condition with only a little over 40,000 miles all-wheel drive. It is a very special vehicle and it can be yours on cars and bids. So once you finish watching this video, click the link in the description below to visit Visit the live auction for this Oldsmobile Bravada where you can bid on it and buy it only on cars and bids. All right, time for the quirks and features of the original Oldsmobile Bravada. Starting with an overview of the basics. Why should you care about this? Well, the Bravada was not the first luxury SUV. By the time this came out in 91, the Range Rover had already been on sale, the Jeep Grand Wagoneer had come and gone, but the Bravada was probably the first luxury SUV to follow the formula that so many brands use now, which is take a regular SUV, luxurify it, make it nice, sell it from a premium brand, and then you have a luxury SUV. So many followed this. The Lexus RX, the Cadillac Escalade, the Lincoln Navigator, the Acura MDX, the Audi Q5, the list goes on and on and on. And it started here with the Bravada, which was based on the Chevy Blazer at the time. In fact, a lot of media reports when this car came out dubbed it a Blazer wearing a tuxedo. It was a luxury version of a regular SUV, a concept that at the time was a shock. So the Bravada was based on the S10 Chevy Blazer. That's the smaller Blazer, not the larger old school K5 Blazer. The S10, which had come out for the 1983 model year. Now, the S10 Blazer was originally only a two-door SUV, but in 91, they expanded the model range to offer a four-door to compete with the new Ford Explorer that was also coming out. And they figured that would be a nice time to introduce a luxury version under the luxury Oldsmobile Blazer brand name, and that was the Bravada. Now, the Bravada was only ever offered as a four-door model, and it was sold through three generations. The first gen went 91 to 94, and then there were two subsequent Bravada generations to stick around as the luxury SUV heated up. Unfortunately, the Bravada never heated up. Despite being kind of the beginning of this whole fad, the Bravada was basically the only luxury SUV that ever failed. <laughs> But it did fail, largely because the Oldsmobile brand name just wasn't all that strong. Within a few years, you had luxury SUVs from Lexus, Acura, Mercedes, BMW. Nobody wanted an Oldsmobile, even if it was kind of the beginning. And the weak Oldsmobile brand wasn't the Bravada's only problem. Even though it started this trend, it didn't do the best job of it. I say that because the Bravada really was just a dressed-up Chevy Blade. Later luxury SUVs that followed this formula would get totally new interiors, different bodies, different powertrains. They looked different from the regular SUVs they were based on, but not the Bravada. It looked very similar and it shared its powertrain. It was a 4.3 liter V6 that made 160 horsepower, at least in 91. In 92, the Bravada got a power boost to 200 horsepower, but it still had kind of a trucky, unrefined 
refined powertrain shared with the Blazer and other General Motors trucks. Now, the Bravada was only ever offered with a four-speed automatic transmission, but it did have one big luxury advantage over the Blazer. It had a full-time all-wheel drive system that they called Smart Track instead of a shiftable four-wheel drive, where you were in rear-wheel drive all the time with the Blazer until you needed four-wheel drive, then you shifted into it. General Motors correctly figured out that luxury buyers would rather not be bothered with shifting into four-wheel drive. They just wanted the car to handle it itself. And so the Bravada did that, an early all-wheel drive system in a luxury application. Of course, General Motors was right about this, and this too became a standard in luxury SUVs as the years went on. No more shift levers and buttons to push. Instead, all-wheel drive systems that were always on, and they did the work. But while all-wheel drive was a smart idea and the Bravada itself was a good plan, some of the other decisions General Motors made <laughs> this vehicle weren't so well executed. The body, the styling and design, is probably the best example. It just didn't look all that different from the Blazer. The biggest difference was General Motors decided the Bravada would be all one color. That was more luxurious than the two-tone that most of the S10 Blazer models had back in the early 90s. So the Bravadas were one color, but that included this ugly bumper that was grafted on to the front. You can see it stick out it has this massive panel gap it certainly does not look luxurious and the same was true in back another ugly bumper grafted on with a huge panel gap instead of anything that was integrated into the car and being the same color as the rest of the bravada this ugly protruding bumper kind of stuck out both visually and well literally other than that changes to the outside of the bravada compared to the blazer were fairly minimal you do have different wheels the Bravada has these beautiful 15-inch alloy wheels, and they went to the trouble of hiding the lug nuts behind this locking center cap to class up the experience. <laughs> That's a, is a minor, subtle detail, but they did it. The Bravada, of course, also had its own grill, as you can see. Basically a twin grill, one on each side, with the Oldsmobile logo right there in the middle, reminding you this is the luxury version of the Blazer. And then there's the pinstriping, which is most obviously seen on that front-mounted Oldsmobile logo. It looks ridiculous, but it also goes all the way down the side of the car. This was probably a dealer installed upgrade that they screwed you on and got you to pay an extra 500 bucks for pin striping. But the original owner of this Bravada did just that and no doubt felt it helped to class up the look compared to a standard Blazer. One other adjustment that Oldsmobile made to the outside for the Bravada, the taillights have this little Oldsmobile logo in them. Tiny little logo just stuck in there. You wouldn't really see it, but it was a subtle upgrade over the Blazer. It didn't do much but it was there. Now, although exterior changes were not huge compared to the Blazer, the interior did get some fairly substantial upgrades, the most obvious and most important of which was the gauge cluster, which as you can see is a CRT screen. Instead of an old school traditional gauge cluster with old fashioned gauges, this is all digital. Of course, it looks ridiculous by modern standards, but back in the early 90s, this would have looked very advanced and very high tech. And the digital works for everything. Even the tachometer, when you increase RPMs, it builds digitally, as you can see. Some of my very favorite things about this CRT screen gauge cluster, number one, the fuel. You can see the fuel is low and the fuel light flashes at you digitally. But maybe even better, the turn signal. Put on the turn signal and you can see this animation pops up on this screen. It must have seemed very futuristic back in the early 90s. Of course, you can also see Speed is given here as a digital readout. You don't even have a traditional speedometer. Pretty advanced compared to the everyman Chevy Blazer. By the way, one other interesting thing about the CRT gauge cluster, the speedometer must not be connected directly to the wheels. It must give its display based on like the RPMs you're traveling and the gear you're in. I say this because when I rev the car while I'm stopped, it shows that the speed is climbing, which it isn't. 
because I am stopped. But you can see I'm revving the engine, the speed is climbing. I guess it must be using some sort of math problem to display the speed instead of some sort of sensor or connection to the wheels themselves. It's rare you find a car that will increase its speedometer even when it stopped. That must have been a little bit of an unforeseen General Motors drawback of the CRT screen. Now, the other big upgrade that the Bravada got was just a lot more luxury in here. And back in the early 90s in GM, that meant leather. You have these large overstuffed leather seats with ruffled leather and piping in the center. And that was a big improvement over the blazer and its cloth. This looked the part with luxurious leather seats. But while you're looking at the seats, the other very obvious thing you notice in the interior of this Bravada is that it's red. And back in this era for General Motors, that meant that everything was red. You saw the seats, of course they're red, but it didn't stop there. The door panels, every surface on the door panels, it's all red. The seat belts are red. The storage lid covers on the center console are red. The carpeting all throughout this car, every little bit of carpeting is red. And the floor mats on top of the carpeting are also red. The dashboard is red. The headliner is all red. Even the sun visors are are red in this interior. It was a giant love fest of the color red, inside and out. That's just how GM did it back in the day. And it seems a little old fashioned now. But there were additional luxury touches in the Bravada. One example is fog lights. You can see them up front below the bumper looking cool and I guess sportier or nicer or classier, whatever it was, the Bravada had them. The only problem was this interior was designed without the concept of needing a switch for fog lights, and so it was added here as a total and complete afterthought. <laughs> Same thing was true with power mirrors. The Bravada had them, it was luxurious, and once again it had to be stuck here as a total afterthought and not actually integrated into the design of the interior. One other nice luxury touch the Bravada had, the rear view mirror would show the direction you were traveling, a rear view mirror compass. This this became quite common throughout the 1990s, but in the early 90s it was only on luxury vehicles like the Bravada. Of course, another luxury the Bravada had was that all-wheel drive system, and they reminded you of it by putting a badge in the center that says Smart Track. Just so you remember, there's no switch in here to put on four-wheel drive. Instead, the car does that for you like a good concierge. And how about this luxury touch? Right above that badge, you have these panels. Lift them up, and you have cigarette lighters here. Two different cigarette lighters in the center console, and that's in addition to one more in the center control stack here. Three separate cigarette lighters in the late 80s and early 90s. The more cigarette lighters you had, the more luxury you had. And this center console also included cup holders. You tap on this panel and they pop out. They are too small and too shallow to fit basically any cup, but they were there. And in the early 90s, not a lot of vehicles had cup holders, but the Bravada did. But beyond all the luxury touches in this interior, there were also some interesting late 80s, early 90s General Motors quirks as you might imagine. Probably the best example of one such quirk is the climate controls, which are mounted here on the side of the gauge cluster. <laughs> not in the center where the passenger can easily reach them with larger dials and buttons. Instead, you got to kind of reach into the steering wheel and gear selector area, and it's strange to put them there, but it was General Motors. One thing I love in this interior is directly below the dashboard, you have this large storage panel that runs basically the entire width from the center over to the passenger side. This was nice additional storage beyond just what the standard glove box gave you. And a Another nice item on the lower part of the dashboard is this climate vent, which you turn on the vents, they blow on your face and your upper body, but this one also keeps your lower body cool or warm, whatever you wanted, a nice additional vent you don't see in modern cars. 
And next up, here's an interesting quirk. You open up the glove box in the Bravada, you take out the stuff that's in there, and you can see there is a label that shows a bunch of different codes. This is your build label, just like Porsches have on the inside of their front hood that shows their different options. Well, the Bravada has it too, the original build label for this car, making sure you know exactly what it came with. Now, the other stuff in this glove box is, of course, fantastic and hilarious. You have the original owner's manual colored to match both the exterior and interior of this car. And on the inside cover, it also touts the Oldsmobile Edge Roadside Assistance Program. In fact, there is a separate booklet in here reminding you of the Oldsmobile Edge. It was a special feature you certainly didn't get if you bought a Blazer or a Jimmy. Only the finest Oldsmobile customers had the Oldsmobile Edge. And next we move on to the back seat of the Bravada. This was not just a luxury SUV, but also family transport. And back here, you have the same overstuffed leather seats as you had in front. You can see the ruffled leather, the piping. They still wanted to emphasize the luxury, even for rear seat passengers. And I gotta say, the other thing back here that surprises me, there's a decent amount of space. The original Bravada, not a long vehicle, it'd be a common compact SUV by modern standards, but there's knee room, there's hip room, there's head room. It actually has decent space back here for rear seat passengers, even for adults and even taller ones. And the luxury continued with the ashtrays. Both rear doors contained individual ashtrays. You would push and your ashtray would slide out and then you could deposit your ashes. Once again, real luxury in this period was the ability to smoke more conveniently. Now, one thing they didn't have was headrests on this back seat. You can see there's not even holes where you put them in. They just didn't have them. The concept of whiplash and headrests and how helpful headrests can be, it hadn't yet been invented. <laughs> it hadn't been thought of yet. And so if you got rear-ended and you were sitting in the back of a Bravada, you were just going to get whipped around on your nice overstuffed leather seats. And finally, we move on to the cargo area of the Bravada. Now you get back here and there's a switch on the tailgate that lets you choose between opening the glass and opening up the tailgate. You can flip the switch one way for the glass, one way for the whole gate. There's also a button in the interior right here in the center control stack. You press this button and it automatically pops open the rear window, which would have been a real luxury back in the early 90s. Most cars did not have interior cargo area releases, but you get back here, you open up the glass from that button and then you open up the gate and then you have access to the Bravada cargo area, which well, as you can see, is not particularly interesting. And in fact, a lot of it is taken up by this spare tire, which of course sits inside a large red cover. Now, the Blazers from this era offered a rear mounted spare tire. And I think the Bravada did too, but it wasn't very classy. That's a thing that trucks had. So for the Bravada, they stuck it in the cargo area, which of course isn't a solution that you would do today, given how much space it takes up. Now, the benefit was if you really needed more space, you could fold down the rear seats and then have a large cargo area back here. But with the seats in place, some of your space was robbed by that tire. Now, the other thing you'll notice looking back here is there's a lot of red. Like I said, the cover over the spare tire, but everything else, once again, all carpeting back here, all plastic back here, it's all red in the back of this Bravada. They just couldn't help themselves. They were making a red interior. Everything had to be read. And other interesting items, the spare tire wasn't the only unusual General Motors compromise back here. Another one was the rear wiper motor. It had a large motor sticking off through the glass, and so they had to cover it with this plastic panel that doesn't look very good, but it is finished in red. And then on the tailgate itself, you can see the trim doesn't go all the way across. Instead, it's interrupted at the very end with this kind of cut out. That was for the spare tire. There was an indent to make sure that the tailgate closed just fine with the spare tire in there. A bit of a disappointing compromise. And once again, of course, 
finished in red. And finally, our last item to discuss back here. You can see the badging, Oldsmobile Bravada all-wheel drive. I gotta say, looking at this vehicle and thinking about this generation of Blazer, Bravada, Jimmy, General Motors was pretty impressive. They came out with this Blazer in 83, which was before basically any other midsize family SUV. They came out with the luxury version in 91 which was before basically any other midsize luxury SUV. And this generation of Blazer also gave us the GMC Typhoon and the GMC Cyclone, a performance SUV and a performance pickup truck years before those segments became popular with other vehicles and other brands. This was way ahead of its time. But like most things from General Motors, it was ahead of its time, but not executed all that well, and others did it better later. And so no one remembers this Blazer and Bravada particularly fondly, but they really did have some good ideas. And this was one of them. All right, driving the 91 Oldsmobile Bravada. I have wanted to review one of these for a long time because this car really was an interesting turning point in the car world. Even though it's not remembered for having any impact because it didn't later become popular and you know impressive, uh, it was an impactful vehicle. It was sort of the beginning of this, all right, let's do a midsize luxury SUV. You know, no one was doing it. There was no Lexus version of the Forerunner. There was no Infiniti version of the Pathfinder. It, it hadn't happened yet. And GM decided to take the first step. And like I said, they were pretty on top of it. They also came out with the Typhoon and the Cyclone, and they really had this idea, hey, we're going to do some more stuff with this line, the S10 Blazer and, and, and Jimmy line. And uh, none of it was successful, but they tried it and paved the way for others to be successful. So how does it drive? You're probably wondering. The answer is not particularly well. <laughs> No, that, that's selling it short. It drives fine. I mean, it's a, it's a nice car um, in the sense that it does what you want it to do. You turn the wheel, it turns. You press the accelerator, it accelerates. It's got good interior room. What it doesn't do is provide any form of luxury experience. Um, luxury cars were different back in the day anyway. They certainly didn't feel as cloud-like and luxurious as most modern vehicles, but this one is especially kind of trucky and old school, like the Blazer it was based on. And I gotta be honest, as I sit here driving this, I do wonder, did they put in any effort to make it more luxurious in terms of a driving experience. And I, I kind of wonder if it's no. I don't know that they beefed up the suspension and made it softer. I don't, certainly they didn't make the engine seem less harsh. It's still loud and trucky. You were driving just sort of a luxurified truck. And that was another maybe drawback of the General Motors SUV beginning, luxury SUV beginning, as opposed to some of the other brands. Now, in the early 90s, every SUV felt trucky. And so as a result, this was kind of a surprise even to exist in the first place. The idea that someone would want to combine the trucky nature of a truck with the luxury of a luxury car. But they gave it a shot. And it's really an early, you can tell, I mean, this is early, 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 because like I said, they didn't try to dress it up and make it more luxurious. Now, with that said, driving this around, you do understand why people wanted it back in the day. Like, it, it has a high seating position, and very few luxury cars did. It has all-wheel drive, which made it drivable in the winters in, you know, Detroit, Chicago, Denver, the Northeast. There was some benefit to this vehicle. There was some, like, hey, maybe I do want to combine my luxury car with my SUV. Um, maybe, and, and of course, it was family-sized. Like, there was some thought. I, you could see the glimmer. You could see the spark. Like, hmm... This is interesting, and, and this wasn't the car that did it, obviously, as I discussed, it was kind of a failure, but you could see how this could be desirable to someone as sort of a beginning of the process. It's interesting, as you ride in this, you almost feel like you are riding in like an, a, a piece of kind of important history in the car world. Um, as I'm surrounded by, you know, Lincoln Aviators and Lexus TX. Uh, you know, like that's this. It's just 35 years after. This kind of started this, this, this whole thing and way, way, way sooner. And from that sense, it's an interesting car. And from the sense of its quirks, it's quirky and interesting. But from the way it drives, it just kind of drives like an early 90s GM, 
you know, blazer, sort of rough, sort of loud, sort of slow kind of vehicle. The driving experience is certainly the least interesting and also least desirable part of this early Bravada. And so that's the original Oldsmobile Bravada. It's amazing to see this as a predecessor to the formula that's become so common today. Take a regular SUV, dress it up a bit, market it a certain way, and voila, you've got luxury. That is so prevalent now, and it really is special to see how it was done 30 years ago. And now it's time to give this Bravada a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 39 out of 100, which places the Bravada here against some sort of similar SUVs from this era. Truthfully, the Bravada surprised me for how GM approached luxury at the time. Specifically, it looks nicer than a Blazer, it has more equipment than a Blazer, the interior's been dressed up compared to a Blazer, but the driving experience is basically the same. The suspension feels similar, the engine performance is identical. The original Bravada is an amazing look at the history of the luxury SUV, and I'm truly thrilled I had the chance to spend the day with one.